Where we will go right now is we'll get something out of the way, something I think you will enjoy talking about, something the listeners will enjoy hearing about, and that is your review of the latest A&E biography of WWE superstars, this one being the Iron Sheik. You know, I was looking forward to this one when I uh, heard they were doing it, because obviously I know the Sheik's basic story, but I had never seen, has his wife or kids ever been on any video anywhere? Uh, had, had never seen them, didn't know a lot about, you know, the details of his early life past that he was, you know, the much publicized Iranian army champion, bodyguard for the Shah, et cetera, et cetera. But they had great old pictures of, you know, his younger life in Iran before he, you know, uh, uh, even got into wrestling, or into pro wrestling. And also, I love the... <laughs> The fucking chair they had him sitting in when they did the shots. And he, I mean, you know, you could imagine that was 1600 and something, and there was the king in Persia or whatever. But uh, I was especially... The only thing that I thought that they really skipped over in a lot of instances was, you know, the way that he morphed into the... They just went from Ali Vaziri to the Iron Sheik. There was no Hussein Arab, Great Hussein, the different, you know, uh, ways that he evolved that. It's just what did, uh, I guess we're jumping ahead, but yeah, Greg said, you know, his his mom suggested it at dinner or whatever. But anyway. His mom suggested the name. Whoever would have heard of a Sheik in wrestling? It, it, what, yeah. I you want to talk about <laughs> things unmentioned in the documentary, not to take anything away from the Iron Sheik, the actual Sheik, who had to be known as the original Sheik for years because of the Iron Sheik, not a mention of him. Yeah, and well, we'll get there. Um, but it, as, as again, uh, they were back to the standard talking heads on this one. Where's Dave Zarin? Well, we need him. He did a good job. See, he, he did a good job. They penalized him. They never fucking used him. Again. Well, he grew up a Dusty fan. I'm sure he didn't like the Iron Sheik. Well, like, he probably could have said something better about it than the cast of characters. Well, you thought. know what? More importantly, and this isn't even necessarily to take away from Sam Roberts, who clearly loves WWE, but how come WWE never has any actual experts or historians on the documentaries? Like, that's where you don't have to worry about them saying something crazy. And again, it's produced. You're going to edit out whatever you don't want. Why aren't there actual historians interviewed for these things? It would make them better. Well, because then they would, to be honest, they would probably, and I've had this issue when, you know, when I've done stuff for Dark Side or Tales from the Territories or whatever, when you actually know all the details or many of the details about a given subject, it makes it harder to tell on television in 45 minutes plus commercials. So they tend to just want people to make generic statements that will just move the thing along. Uh, and, and they got a bunch of good people that, to say generic things. I'll say that for them. Uh, but it, look at Google this for me real quick. Cause here's something they never said on the program. What year was the Sheik born? And while you're doing that, I will mention that I never knew. 1942. Okay. 1942. We'll come back to that. I never knew his parents had a wrestling gym. And obviously, when he first got into business, part of the promotion of him, as they mentioned, was that he was a high-level amateur and Olympic team member and blah, blah, blah. But they went into a lot of detail here. He was the Iranian army champion, and that's one of the reasons why he was picked to be a bodyguard of the Shah and his various family members. So there he is with that, you know, stoic face behind all these political figures. And I had no idea of the, because I just had never heard this story. And I guess I it was out there, and I just never bothered to look for it, that the wrestling champion, what was his name, Takti, that had mentored Sheik, and Sheik looked up to him like all the other wrestlers did in that country. He got too popular and outspoken and on the wrong side of the Shah and ended up suicided. I did not know that. That's what compelled Sheik to say, you know what, maybe I ought to get out of here too, because if they'll do it to him, they might do it to me. 
I wish they had explained a little bit more about the actual process of him leaving. I mean, based on what they know. And he's alive, so he could tell them. But it was just, and all of a sudden he was on a plane to Minnesota. Was it that easy to just leave the country, to leave working for the Shah and jump on yeah. a plane? Yeah, I, I and... I mean, obviously, they they kind of alluded to, and once again with editing, because I'm sure people told this story. But Alan Rice was the Minnesota Wrestling Club, not the professional one, but the amateur, the wrestling club coach, and also coached the Olympic team. And he had met Kosrau in you know in some of these meets, and he she knew his name. And where he was, so he went there. But, yeah, the process of him actually getting out of the country and getting on a plane probably got glossed over quite a bit. Right after Takti got murdered. Yeah, yeah. Allegedly, possibly. Well, well, maybe while everybody was investigating that, she just said, I'll, I'll be over here. Uh, but so this was 1969, and that's why, because he was already 27 years old by the time he even came to this country. And that he obviously is still amateur wrestling and again you know the it was cool that the uh the antithesis of the american hero the iron sheik from tehran iran was actually an assistant coach on our olympic te wrestling team at one point but anyway it, it, that's where then and I can believe this, obviously, uh, Rice being in Minnesota, um, high-level amateur wrestling coach, Vern Gagne, even though it was pro wrestling, remember, folks, Vern was the NCAA amateur wrestling champion in, what, 40, whatever the fuck, and was always, he sponsored in the 72 Olympics, Ken Patera and Chris Taylor, Taylor in wrestling, Patera in weightlifting. He liked real athletes. So when he gets pitched a guy with this kind of credentials, that's why there's footage of Kaz in the uh, in the barn with Flair and Patera and Taylor and Brunzel and Sergeant Slaughter was in a couple of the clips. And that was, you know, all of their entree into the wrestling business. And then, you know, that's... Uh, he. <laughs> Broke in Hall in the Ring and refereeing. Imagine that. That's what a lot of guys did. Remember, we had guys doing that in OVW. Vernet Gregg doing it. Vernet Gregg doing it. Well, it, it, to be honest, the person that was most trusted not to fucking wreck the truck or sell the trailer is usually the one who got to drive the ring truck. But if you help, if you were just on the stooge crew helping carry the ring post, it wasn't quite as much responsibility. But they let Kaz drive the truck. And that's why I, when they first brought his wife in, I knew he was married. I, you know, never sat down again and realized it had been almost 50 years they, they were together. And she looks 30 years younger than he does now. And they've been together almost 50 years since the mid-70s. I was like, what the fuck? Uh, but can you, there, I, she seems like such a nice, sweet, pleasant woman. They, you know, they say sometimes opposites attract, but, um, how I, I can't, you can't Google how old she is because she's a private citizen. It probably wouldn't say anyway, but she looks remarkably younger than he does to have been still together for so long. So at that, that's the point where we, you know, there's obviously not any footage really. I don't think maybe some AWA clips or something in Florida of Ali Vaziri, but I saw him on uh, Nick Goulas's TV doing jobs in 1974 when I guess he got the worst of that. Uh, Flair broke in and got sent to North Carolina <laughs> and fucking Sheik broke in and got sent to Nick in Nashville. But he was, I've, I still have the notes. He was used as a, a job guy on television, they talked about his amateur background, but not much because they were pushing his opponents, but just to, you know, justify him being in the ring. He had hair. He was introduced at 215 pounds and had abs and wore the Olympic wrestling singlet, right? He was a baby face. 
was a babyface, Ali Vaziri. And I, I think uh, he was probably, I remember seeing his name and seeing him on TV. And I think I've got to go back and look. He might have even been on in one of the preliminaries on one of the first garden shows I went to. Um, but nothing to speak of. He was just getting experience. And then that's where this whole thing just eliminates like five years of time and he becomes the Iron Sheik, and you know they they also conflated several time periods in the WWF because yeah uh, well and and you'll you can probably quote chapter and verse on that more than I can, but it got complicated here. So let's talk about what what did they leave out between seventy five and eighty? Great Hussein Hussein Arab. Texas run first time in the Carolinas, I think, wasn't it? Yeah. Um, it, it, that was the way that he evolved. That he, yes, they first time he, in the Northeast. First time in the Northeast. What was it? Great Hussein or Hussein Arab when he was in WWWF? I believe technically he used both, and I think he won. Maybe I'm wrong. Was it the first battle royal at Madison Square Garden, or was it? I got to look into that. But he he got a pretty nice little push in like '79. And he had already been doing that gimmick. What wasn't Texas the first place that he switched heel, shaved his head, and became, for all intents and purposes, the Iron Sheik, but under the name Hussein Arab? That's what I always thought. I have all those like programs from '77 in Fort Worth and Dallas, and he's all over those. Right, and because I was getting those, and obviously the program wasn't saying. Little do you people know that three years ago this guy was a kid named Ali Vaziri. So. It surprised me that I'm like, who is this guy we've never heard of? I've never seen this guy before. And he's in the main events in Texas. This, and then, you know, the way news traveled then and without internet, it was probably several months. And then I heard or saw or figured something out. But he looked completely unlike Ali Vaziri, who wasn't that memorable to begin with, except for the name, which kind of rolls, flows off the tongue. But whereas, again, he in the documentary here, in the biography, he realizes he needs to be a bad guy. And I think probably some of that was, potential. who would have been booking at that point in time in Texas? Was it Gary Hart? Probably Gary Hart, because he's on those shows. Boom goes the dynamite, loves a foreign menace. And, you know, so I'm sure if he heard, well, this guy's a, a shooter, an amateur, you know, legitimate amateur great, but at the same time is Iranian and, you know, or can be from any place we're mad at over there, his mind started turning. But anyway, then all of a sudden, here's, you know, Ali Vaziri is head shaved, he's 40 pounds bigger back then. He still was in great shape, but he put on a lot of size and he looked completely different. And he was wrestling. He didn't go as far as the, the original Sheik's just craziness and two minute match and, you know, whatever the fuck. But depending on the territory and what they wanted, he definitely, I mean, when he came to Memphis, when he and Ron Bass had a uh, bull rope match, in Louisville, he pulls a goddamn 10-inch kitchen knife that he had actually found in the back uh, that they, they'd they done some catering thing or something, and it, it was halfway kind of a cake-spreading or a icing-spreading thing. It wasn't really a sharp knife, but it looked great, and he pulled that out of his boot, and he's sawing on Ron Bass's head. He's fucking, people are going crazy, right? He could do that, but he could also do the big high gut wrench suplexes and all the the amateur throws that now people are used to in their commonplace. But back then it was, and plus he could throw guys a lot higher back then. That was the thing, the Sheik from, or Iron Sheik from, what, 77 to 82, 3, he was still young enough and in shape enough that you could see that beast of an athlete that he was, and he was scary and intimidating and violent. And the way he could throw guys around, and you knew not to fuck with him, 
and he had the fucking face and the look anyway. And then that's why I told you to look up his age because he didn't fucking turn pro until he was, he didn't start training until he was 30 and turned pro shortly after that. By the time he gets the gimmick, he's 35. And by the time he, 1983 rolls around four in the WWF, he's 40 and had been on the road for a while and was starting to develop bad habits. So, I mean, it's still, you know, the, the Iron Sheik is a memorable gimmick and a character and et cetera for what he did in the 80s, but the people widespread never actually got a chance to see him when he was a fucking monster of an athlete. Jim, I have a card here, just to give an example. This is 1977, July 19th, 1977, Dallas. Gino Hernandez defeated Randy Colley. Skip Young defeated, I don't know this guy, you probably do, you definitely do, I'm sure, Reno Tafuli? Uh, uh, that was one of the Samoans not related to the Anuahi family. Uh, remember T.O. and Tapu, or yeah. T.O. and Reno? Yeah, the Islanders. Yeah, there you go. Well, the Isla Alpha and Sika were the Islanders at one point, too. Yeah. So it's confusing. Ox Baker defeated Leo Seitz. Big John Studd and Iron Sheik Farouk. Yes. Defeated Jimmy Snuka and Tommy Siegler. And the main event, Fritz Von Erich defeated Bruiser Brody to win the Texas Brass Knucks title. That's right. I, the earliest name was Sheik Farouk, wasn't it? I think so. You know, I forgot about that until I went and looked at the result, but that's... But I saw in all those old programs. They yeah. wouldn't use Sheik Farouk, especially in his first run in the WWF because of Abdullah Farouk and the Grand Wizard. And that was that would have been stepping on something that Vince Sr. would have probably didn't want to do. But nevertheless, yes. So he went through several different incarnations of trying to find out what is his name as this Arab character, right? Hey, can I say something to jump ahead for one second? Because yeah. I'm going to forget this. And I never knew this. You, I'm sure, once again, did. I didn't know Jerry Lawler was the one who painted Khomeini on the flag. Yes. <laughs> I never knew that. That was so cool to learn. Because, it, it, well, we, we, it, it, we are getting ahead. But actually, that's kind of a story. Because I, I said I saw Ali Vaziri as a job guy on TV in Tennessee in the 70s, right? And then, you know, we, we, I find out later on he is uh, the guy who became Hussein Arab, whatever the fuck, right? And has become the Iron Sheik. So 1982, they bring him in the territory. Because remember, I've told, and you can look it up on YouTube, folks, the, uh, the story of Sheik always had to talk on the microphone and the Kentucky commissioner who didn't want guys talking on the microphone and would try <laughs> to find them. And uh, the fuck the commissioner story, right? That's out on YouTube. Um, but the I guess the first or second week that Sheik was in a territory, he, because he wasn't living here yet, he was flying in from wherever he'd been, and he stayed overnight in Louisville on, on a Tuesday night and needed a ride to Evansville on Wednesday. And I get Teeny knew that me and my mom would be coming and see everybody else, I guess, uh, well, number one, it was, you know, it, he had to ride with heels, so that let the baby faces out, and most of the heels lived in uh, Nashville, so they went back home for Evansville, and I guess Jimmy Hart wasn't around because he was on the Mem it lived in Memphis, so he would have been going, but nevertheless, Teeny says, can you and your mom take the Iron Sheik? I'm like, okay, because like I said, he was an intimidating-looking motherfucker. We'd never met him before. And at the same time, you heard the the grasp of the English language that the Sheik has on this biography episode, and he's been in this country for 50 years, right? You can imagine what it was like 40 years ago. Plus, he I'm the photographer, and my mom is the kindly lady that's going to be selling gimmicks at the show at the gimmick table. So it's not like he's going to talk smart. And I'm smart, but I it's not I don't know him. It's not like I can just say, oh, by the way, Sheik, I'm with it. I'm with the program, as Frank Spaceman Hickey would say. I'm with it. I'm with it. So <laughs> we pick him up 
And uh, making conversation, Sheik, uh, what did you do today? Oh, go to gym. Work hard. Work hard. He slapped his chest. <laughs> God damn it. It's like he's on TV. I said, well, uh, you know, uh, how do you, how you like the territory so far? Or the Louisville or Memphis? Oh, very good. Very good. And he, you know, he asked my mom or me a question about as we'd pass something. What is that? Or whatever. But finally, as I recall, he, he said, so we're just driving down the road, right? The conversation is strained. Uh, uh, Mrs. Cornette, do you like the rock and roll music? <laughs> yeah, yes. Would you like to hear the radio? And we turned the radio on. So he was a very a pleasant, respectful person with a, you know, like I said, limited grasp of language, and and we could really talk about. He asked me more questions about this territory than I asked him. It'd be like, "Is this good town, Evansville, tonight?" Well, it's, it, eh. <laughs> you know that kind of thing. What do I say? I don't. Then he's gonna go and say, "Oh, Cornette, yeah. the kid photographer said this <laughs> fucking town sucks." <laughs> I'm like, "Well, it's not as big as Louisville or Memphis or Nashville or Jackson, Tennessee." Or in Lexington. But they have a post office. They do. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm just talking about the crowd, the house, the gate, <laughs> the money. The money is what he was looking for. <laughs> and then, and it was in Evansville a night that, remember, Jimmy, it won't strike. It won't strike. <laughs> the fire story. Fireball. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> His fucking lighter got wet. <laughs> Oh, but anyway, um, no, no, it was in Louisville that Sheik's fire wouldn't go, and it was in Evansville that Lawler's wouldn't go, because that's when Lawler chased him all around the Evansville Coliseum, flicking the fucking big lighter <laughs> in his face, because they'd already cut to promos. <laughs> Nevertheless, so it, it, you know, but that was the thing is, this guy completely, you know, between the time he got into business and the late 70s, completely transformed himself to even... You know, people close around the business didn't really know what the fuck it was. And then he's got this gimmick. And and that's what I liked, especially Georgia, the Georgia TV, Georgia Championship Wrestling. Um, the early run that he had there in, what was it, 81, 82, he was moving a lot quicker. And, you know, he was, a lot of people don't remember the iron Sheik for his flying elbow smash and all that other stuff, but no, he, he could fucking move, but then he's, he's 40. And after that, you know, the, the hostage crisis also for people who didn't live through it, that's why his heat was nuclear because oh, that's where nightline came from. Um, that's that's right. where, you know, nightline originated on ABC as what was it? America held hostage day 340, however long it lasted. They had a, a special news program every night updating America on what was going on with our people in Iran. And if, if, if say what you want about Kaz. He had fucking balls, as everybody said on the documentary, that he leaned into this shit. And anything that he could do to make himself more believable, he wasn't scared of anybody. And oh, and you <laughs> mentioned the the Lawler flag. Yeah. When when he came in the territory, he had the Iranian flag, and he used it for first few weeks. I can't remember. I wasn't taking notes, and then suddenly the Khomeini popped up, and and I got I have pictures with him and Jimmy Hart uh, with that flag spread out and Jimmy was rolling his eyes afterwards like I'm going to take pictures of this fucking thing it's going to be killed yeah you know uh, what? you know seemingly had no worries about any of the heat Fred Blassie appears to be having a party as oh I my, call Blassie oh, yes no <laughs> Fred Blassie let me tell you when he was 70 years old if a motherfucker had come with Fred Blassie come at Fred Blassie with a machete said I'll cut your guts out from he would come on man he'd have picked his teeth with it <laughs> Fred Blassie loved that shit. He was a salty. And that motherfucker was a wrestler in the 30s. He was, wasn't he in the Navy too? <laughs> he was born in the 19 teens for fuck's sake. He probably used to eat rotten K 
cow livers from the street. What are you fucking... talking about? I mean, they what? had nothing. Back. Oh, Freddie Blassie, by God. <laughs> back when men were men and sheep were scared, I'm telling you. And well, and then uh, I was about to mention they they went through all of his various gimmicks. He did every gimmick associated with, you know, a sheik or a you know Persian person or the Persian club challenge, which was legitimate. He could do that with the real clubs when it first became a thing in wrestling. And then I think toward the latter few years that he ever did it. Either somebody stole the clubs or he just made gimmick clubs. They weren't as heavy, but whatever. But even those but, gimmick clubs only he could do. I saw shows where in the locker room guys couldn't do it. Well, I mean, I, I saw a couple. I think it might have been on a couple of Dennis Corluso yeah. shows. It looked like they fucking found some duct tape and a goddamn couple of bricks and put it together. But I don't know what it was. But. The original <laughs> ones from, from the late 70s, early 80s, when he'd go through the territory. No, it was a it was a big deal that the guys in the locker room, and we're talking, you know, Road Warrior level people, size people. Think of the size of guys in the early 80s in the business. And it wasn't just the weight, it was a technique that he could do and get them spinning, and they couldn't fucking do it. And the loaded boot, the curly coat. But see, that's the thing. The, the, but the boot itself. The boot came from the Sheik. And that's the right. camel clutch came from the Sheik. Now, of course, the Iron Sheik set back much farther on the camel clutch because, you know, he didn't give a shit. Whereas I guess the Sheik was like, well, I won't break their backs. So I'll just slice them open. But uh, but it all came from the Sheik. When he tells that story about getting the boots, he's like, I called the person. I said, can you... Make me something like these. And they said, yes. Obviously, the part of the story that he's not saying or was said right before they cut that clip was, I saw the Sheik's boots. Yes. And I wanted something like these. And that's what um, he did. And, and he, then he called Bill Ash in <laughs> fucking Paris, Arkansas, and said, make me some Sheik boots. Was the Sheik the first one to wear the pointy-toed boots? I don't know. That's a good question. I don't know. I wonder, and and hey, for our Toronto historians. Brian Solomon may know. Or Brian Solomon, who's a historian from everywhere. Oh, oh what was the goddamn heel in uh, Nanjo Singh in Toronto in the 40s? Did he do pointy boots? We shall see. We'll find out now that we've said it out loud. A nice reminder that Jeff Jarrett was a senior vice president of the WWE at this at the time this was done, what, last year? Yeah, I guess. He was great in this. I thought Jeff Jarrett was tremendous in this, and for the first time, for me at least, watching him talk, not that I, I saw or heard Jerry, but he reminded me a lot of his dad. Yeah. But I thought he was tremendous in this. And, you know... <laughs> Jeff actually, you know, was around and saw some of this stuff so he could actually, and was in the business so he could speak firsthand. So it, it's always good if they would pick the talking heads that at least were alive, breathing oxygen when this shit happened. Anyway. Um, but you said before how it jumped around a lot. That was my biggest problem with the documentary. The early portion was completely fascinating. Everything in Iran and everything yeah. that led up to him leaving. The early stuff with Ganya, we've heard a lot of that stuff, but it's still really cool. Then for like 15 years, they just go <laughs> back and forth and they'll stop telling anything in timeline and just start talking about like a specific thing like the camel on his trunks or his boots or whatever it is, and then go back to something else. It became incoherent at a certain point. Well, yes, if, if you were trying to follow the progression of his career, or if you knew the story, you're like, well, I guess they just weren't going to talk about that, and then they start talking about it after they've talked about shit that happened afterwards. And that's where, basically, it and, and they've got all the footage, it fell apart when he went to the WWF. And 1983, and wins the title and then lose to Hogan, it, it falls apart chronologically. You know, they, they have the match with Hogan, and... Vern offers Sheik a hundred thousand dollars to break Hogan's leg. Um, do you think Vern would have paid it? Because once he does that, if he doesn't have the money in hand, I mean, what's Vern's real incentive? He's just trying to hurt Vince. Well, I think more importantly, Vern would have got what he wanted and not be liable because since he never actually paid him, 
he wouldn't be huh. guilty, right? Yeah, that's true. Yeah. So I don't know if I'd have trusted. I would ask for fifty up front if I was Kazra, but he wasn't going to do it. But, but anyway, if you but if you were Vern Gagne, do you think he must have thought that the Iron Sheik would have done it because of the loyalty to him? I th I think he did because I think he also thought that because Sheik being a legitimate wrestler and Vern just being incensed at what you know, Vince was trying to do and the whole nine yards, he, he thought that, you know, well, Hey, I broke you in and you know, we have similar backgrounds and they're, you know, pulling all this tomfoolery. We got to pull them in line here. Little known fact after Vern said, break Hogan's leg, I'll give you a hundred thousand dollars. He said, I'll give you five grand. If you shave off Gene Okerlund's mustache. <laughs> now that I think Sheik would have collected on. Um, but the point I was going to make and that you had made before me is that after he loses the belt to Hogan, suddenly they go into Sheik and Slaughter. Did that, am I, do I have a brain tumor or was that not two years beforehand? Oh, no, no, no. That was, Hogan won the title in January 84. They started Slaughter Sheik just a couple months later. Just a few Did months they? later. Did yeah. they? Okay, then what am I thinking about? You're thinking... Well, again, Slaughter was in there in 80. He feuded with Patterson in 81, goes back to Mid-Atlantic. The Greensboro match is the beginning of 83, returns to the WWF as a heel. Okay, you know what? I've I've had the alley fight match and the boot camp match yeah. switched around. And then in the, the, the boot camp match, I think, is like May or June, maybe May of 84. That's what it, okay. Then I apologize. I do apologize when I am incorrect. It happens so infrequently. Uh, but again, the besides the fact that is the question answered, who was the best worker of the early 80s overall in the WWF? It was Sergeant Slaughter. Holy mackerel. Because not only was him and Patterson the alley fight, maybe the best match of the WWF days as a territory, but this boot camp match, Slaughter taking those bumps, I love that fucking ring post bump he takes over the top buckle and the whole nine yards. But these had to be, or those had to be, the two most violent WWF matches in history. They, they could have worked in Greensboro or New Orleans or Memphis or whatever. Um, just that, the blood and the intensity and the violence, they got away with it up there somehow. Well, you know, again, those two matches beyond the boot camp match and the alley fight match, what's the other big, really bloody WWF brawl type match you could think of within 15 years around that? Good question. You know, seven and a half years before it, seven and a half years, I can't think of one. So that's why they didn't allow it, I guess. I spaced <laughs> off. I spaced <laughs> off. So that that to go to your point about if they allowed it or not was yeah. very very rare. And uh and boy I'll tell you what one thing that is correct we all heard contemporaneously as they say at the time about the Sheik's $80,000 check for fucking action figures for a quarter. That went through every locker room in the business. Um remember he was one of the initial five figures they put out. Yes. Hulk Hogan, Andre the Giant, Jimmy Snuka, Big John Stud, and the Iron Sheik. And to the fears you always had about we're heels, we wouldn't sell figures. If you buy a babyface figure, you need a heel for them to wrestle. He's got to beat somebody up. So if you bought a Hulk Hogan, you needed an Iron Sheik or a Big John Stud. So what 80 grand in 1985 would probably be what? Uh, almost a quarter of a million today for a quarter, for one quarter of the year. <sighs> 80 grand and 85 would be approximately $224,400 today. Well, see there? Approximately, not counting the cents or anything. And then I liked seeing the footage of Sheik and Nikolai Volkov. Nikolai had just come from Mid South. And boy, what a nice guy. Just again, I'll take a sidetrack here to just say Nikolai Volkov, one of the nicest guys in the history of the business. And he was, gosh, I guess he had to be almost 50 at that point. He was, you know, on the tail end of his in-ring career. But 
he had been a high level bo- amateur boxer at that size and those big fucking hands. And he was incredibly strong. And, you know, even though he wasn't taking the, the bumps he did a, as a youth at that point in time, Nikolai was somebody you wouldn't want to fuck with for real and the, still the nicest guy in the world and always joking and laughing. But it was it, it, the, when they talked about them always getting on each other's nerves is because Sheik took a part of it was the, you know, the language barrier or the culture barrier or him coming over in his mid thirties. He took things literally or seriously or reacted to things same in a different way. And Nikolai is such a fun loving guy. I can see where they could have nattered at each other and it would have been hilarious. And I think that's what the boys said. It was hilarious watching them fucking go at each other. And then, of course, the New Jersey Turnpike incident with Hacksaw Duggan, who had just come in, just debuted in the fucking... And they get pulled over uh, and make national news because... Do you think it, everybody knows that story, I would say, except that there's been so many kids born in the last 30 years or whatever. Does everybody still remember that it made national news because they caught a good guy wrestler and a bad guy wrestler in the, riding in the car together? You know, they showed some of the newscast footage, which I thought was pretty impactful, but no one really, they tried to, but it's really hard to lay out just how big a deal it was to non-wrestling fans or people who didn't like wrestling to all of a sudden see this article in the paper. This was everything that a wrestling fan or let alone someone in the business cringed about. And I believe Jim Duggan has said Vince McMahon, when he got on the phone with him the next day, the only words he said, I think, were, what have you done to us, Jim? Yeah. They thought oh. this was going to be the end. Duggan thought he was cooked, and it, and both he was for a while. Were, and he yeah. was for a while. Paul Bosch got him back, or that Paul Bosch show got him back in. The uh, I'm trying to think how long was it before Vince used either guy again? It was Duggan was gone until I think the end of '87. Because again, after the Paul Bosch retirement show is when he came back. Yeah. The Sheik, I want to say he briefly returned briefly in '88 but he may have worked for Vern in between. And then he obviously came back to the NWA at the end of 88, early 89. And he was under contract there for two years. And then as soon as that contract <laughs> yeah. was up and they didn't automatically renew it because they forgot he existed, <laughs> he became Colonel Mustafa in the WWF. Okay, right? well, uh, the, the point is for the purpose of this exercise, ladies and gentlemen, it wasn't Duggan's cocaine, it was Sheik's cocaine, but it wasn't the drugs. It was the fact that they were caught together in the car a baby face and heel while they were in a program that was considered such a black eye to the business and to Vince's business in general that Sheik was gone for a year briefly returned and Duggan was gone and didn't get the chance to come back and become the American hero Hi-Yo, and all that stuff uh, until he, you know, tore the house down at the Paul Bosch show, which you would expect he would because it was Houston and they loved him. And Vince saw that, well, I've missed out on something here. But that's what kind of offense it was. And again, it's not just a baby face and a heel. It's the Iranian heel and the all-American baby face. Yes. It's yes. as bad a situation you know, as you could have. If it had been Barry Horowitz and... Steve Lombardi. You know, Steve Lombardi, <laughs> there'd have been five good people. Well, now, wait a minute. Did they wrestle on TV once? We don't know. We don't care. But no, it was the epitome of who shouldn't have been in the same place. Duggan was funny, too, saying, I called my wife that night after the show that we went to, and I said, nobody knows. It's great. Yeah, and she yeah. called me the next day. She said, everybody knows. Everybody knows. <laughs> oh, my God. And as a matter of fact, and Hacksaw, another guy, still with the same wife that he had in the well she was his girlfriend in the 80s but nevertheless same person but anyway so that was all they they the 
Iron Sheik era and things just kind of was back and forth. They were showing Georgia and then this and that and the other thing. But we we skipped his formative years. We got the Iron Sheik run there in the 80s. And then, as you just mentioned, he lost his spot, um, went to WCW for George Scott for those two years. <laughs> George Scott gets the job as Booker. Signs the Iron Sheik to a hundred thousand dollar a year contract. George Scott gets fired in three months. Uh, Sheik gets paid for two years. But anyway, um, we got in another war, and that gave him another lease on life with the Gulf War. But with this time as Colonel Mustafa with Adnan Casey, who is now Adnan's really from Iraq, right? He was really an Iraqi. He, I believe, was legitimately a Saddam Hussein supporter, actually. Yes. And uh, so even though Iran and Iraq have had their issues with each other for the purpose of this, which was to piss the American people off at Sergeant Slaughter, who had become a sympathizer, they've got one guy from Iran and one guy from Iraq. I've never understood why, as iconic a face as the Iron Sheik was called Colonel Mustafa, although I did not see all the weekly TV. Did they explain it or just this is what his name is now? I was 11 watching it and they referenced that it had been the Iron Sheik and clearly you knew who it was if you just even watched the cartoon. You knew who he was, but they called him Colonel Mustafa. It seemed kind of silly unless the goal was to just put him in something that can cover up his body for a good portion of the match. I'm not sure. But it seemed to me as a kid to be silly because we knew it was the Iron Sheik. It wasn't even about necessarily the Iran-Iraq thing because, again, I was young. Right. But we knew he was the Iron Sheik. Why is he Colonel Mustafa? <laughs> well, only Vince knew, but it didn't last long. Uh, they, they didn't just gloss over. They outright skipped the WrestleMania L.A. Coliseum debacle in 91 and went straight to SummerSlam. Well, that's good. It gave them a chance not to lie about why they had to yes. move the show out of the uh, stadium. And then I, my, my note on the SummerSlam 91 tag match highlights was, God, Sergeant Slaughter was good. Just what I don't think he's rated highly enough by the modern audience because he came just a little bit before everybody started paying attention to things like that. Uh, but then... <laughs> 1996, and he's back as kind of the the co-manager or whatever the fuck. And that's, I was in the office, folks, and it was like, well, it's chic, you know. Oh, geez. And he's, uh, at that point, he's, uh, what, 50? And, or, you know, no, 50, 50, almost 55. And they even mentioned he was struggling financially. And then, I don't know about this one. They said, well, at this at this point or somewhere around this time frame, he was exposed to crack cocaine at an independent show. I don't know if there had been anything that Sheik hadn't been exposed to at that point in time. Um, but the, the story was true about WrestleMania 17 because we were joking about it. When we heard the finish, everybody said, oh, Sheik's winning because he can't, you know, take the bump over the top. And and whoever it was was telling us, I can't even remember who the agent was or whatever. Said, no, that's actually it. Yeah, he can't, he can't, he can't take it. Oh, God. Okay. And, uh, and Bobby got the line. By the time he gets to the ring, it'll be WrestleMania 37. But at that point, you know, that was pretty much... I mean, he, Sheik had a lot of injuries that had piled up and a lot of miles and et cetera, and he's almost 60, so he's out of the wrestling business in terms of being in the ring, and there weren't the, that many fan fests like there are now all over the place or indie promotions that were just booking legends to come in, but they, they, it seemed like that they wanted to gloss over the level of or at least the length of the period of time that it seemed like poor Sheik was just fucking... We thought he was being taken advantage of by that sleazeball. Who was his agent? Eric Sims. Eric Sims. But he... Obviously, he was everywhere on video and on 
the Stern show and on, you know, early social media video or whatever the fuck, just it seemed like that he was in a bad way and was being taken advantage of for his name or his reputation or a meal ticket or whatever by somebody. The but, Brian you know, Blair thing is what took off. If you remember, he did an interview where he just went completely off on Brian Blair when talking about that WrestleMania three match. Yeah. And that went viral before that was really a thing. And then again, he was on Howard Stern a lot. He kind of became mixed in with that crowd of uh, comedians and oddballs. So there was a whole nother life to him. And, you know, I guess the argument is what's exploitation versus what's trying to find a way for this guy to make a living. Well, I always thought it might be a good idea if they didn't try to put him out to make a living in public when he's ingested various different types of narcotics that may be causing him to act in a way he might regret later on. What do you think in general of wrestling agents? Uh, I'm not talking about like Barry Blousty or not Barry, but Barry Bloom or uh, Barry Blousty. No, I think no, he no. should go back to Hollywood. I'm not talking about Barry Bloom or Braverman or any, but like these guys who are on the indies that are agents that, you know, any thoughts on these? Cause you've probably encountered a bunch of them. Well, yeah. And I don't want to, I don't want to piss at anybody's post toasties myself, but I, I mean, Bill Barron's is uh, legitimate and has been around for a long time and knows everybody and has talked to everybody and loves to talk to everybody and has the energy to do stuff like that. He's, he's a great guy. I can't honestly call anybody else off the top of my head right now that I know is agenting that I would praise. Uh, and the only time that I ever let anybody do that for me at any show was this fucking guy called and just uh, bugged me uh, on a number of occasions. And I said, no, New Jersey's too far. And this is too far. And that's too far. I don't want to come there. I don't want to do that. And finally calls up and says, how about Indiana, Fort Wayne, Indiana? All right. I, the, here's what I want this, this, and this, if you'll set it up with the guy running the show and you take care of all the details, then I'll give you fucking 20% or whatever. And you help me at my booth. Simple as I can fucking make it right. He got there, he'd fucked the whole thing up, and the promoter didn't know what the fuck was going on. <laughs> and I had to I had not only cuss the guy out, I had to call him on a, he had, had, had me and somebody else there, and he said, I got to take so-and-so to the airport. And I, I called him on his phone, I said, I know where you're at because you put me at the same hotel. And I'll see you later if you don't come back here because you owe me some fucking money because this guy didn't know he was supposed to give me the money that you told me that he was going to give me. And when the guy got back, I went out in the parking lot with the fucking racket. <laughs> and I said, just hand me the goddamn money. And he handed me the money. I said, don't ever speak to me again. <laughs> and walked back in and it looked like I just fucking strong armed him if somebody was standing around. But nevertheless, no agents. No, do your own business. But nevertheless, the point is that they they tended to gloss over, obviously, the length and severity of what Sheik's issues were, and, th and they had him at the 2005 Hall of Fame ceremony, which I think all this stuff was still going on at that point, and then told the story that, you know, his wife finally left him because he wouldn't get off of drugs, and then he got off of drugs. and And so now he is... He'll be 81, this old, 81 years old this year if he's not already, I would assume. He's, and he's not on the road much anymore, so I would assume that he's hopefully doing well on that score. But it was, a, like you said, it was a fascinating program, especially the first part. And then his wrestling career, they just kind of bounced back and forth and not a lot with any specificity, nor they just, he started... They skipped five years where he figured this gimmick out. He became the Iron Sheik because Vern Gagne's wife suggested it. <laughs> he ran with that for seven or eight years, got a couple of comebacks. That's what you would know from this. And he did a lot more than that. I'm sure if he was eating dinner at some other promoter's house, he could have been the Silver Sheik or maybe the Golden Sheik. <laughs> but he was the Iron Sheik. No, I remember there was a Golden Sheik, wasn't there? Who was that? Who was that? I remember the Golden Superman. And there was also the Golden Lion. 
And there was also a masked man called the Golden Hawk. There was a Golden Terror. He was also masked. Yeah. And there was also a Golden Shower. Where was that? Apparently in Japan. Meltzer gave it seven stars. <laughs> I don't know how you got there, but as I was saying, a wonderful uh, documentary, even though there are a lot of issues with uh, their management of time and telling a coherent story, I put down before that they don't get experts and stuff. Keith Elliott Greenberg did a good job. I should say that too. Yes, yes. And he was actually alive then. And even Jake, well, I think Keith Elliott Greenberg, didn't he actually, maybe I'm getting the story wrong. Did he actually did a biography of the Iron Sheik and WWE shelved it? Did you ever hear I that? I don't remember. He's done several. I don't know if, uh, if that would have been one of them, but I realized when I was watching this that there's not been an Iron Sheik book, so... Maybe that's why. Yeah, I'll look into that. I think that's the story I heard, but that was the Iron Sheik biography on A&E. And, you know, when the Sheik finally grew that mustache, what a liberating moment that must have been to finally say, I'm not going to shave, I'm going to grow this mustache, I'm going to grow it so long I could twirl it like Raleigh Fingers. He probably looked in the mirror and said, my future's so bright, I got to wear shades. I wondered how hair was going to get us. <laughs> To any, but facial hair was merely the MacGuffin. That's right. <laughs> wild card. <laughs> wild card, bitches. I'll tell you what. If there's anybody that you'd like to, to not get a good look at, if there's anybody that you'd like to put what? some kind of covering over your eyes before you look in their general direction because of the repulsiveness of their appearance and the fact that they give small children nightmares and scare house pets <laughs> well folks don't buy a, an expensive pair of sunglasses and put them on to try to shade yourself from all of that ugly dripping all over somebody's face no you don't want the expensive ones when you get shady rays because shady rays makes high quality sunglasses that are just as good or even better than the expensive ones at a fraction of the price and they're durable. I'm talking about unbreakable. I'm talking about, I don't care how ugly your wife or husband or mother or father or children may be, you look at them with these shady rays on, they will not crack. They will not break. I'm telling you, as a matter of, of fact. Not. Of course well, not. Well, hey, you can even look at Hotchkiss Featherbottom and his Aunt Fanny and Uncle Felcher, and these things will not break. Normally, anybody with any glasses on immediately loses their lenses when they look at the feather bottoms. And these things are so durable, so unbreakable, that I, Chris Rock could have been wearing these at the Oscars last year, and Will Smith wouldn't even have broken the earpieces. That's how durable and, and, and impact-resistant that the Shady Rays are, and they've got to be. Even the earpieces. Even the, well, the things that go over your ear. What are they, do they have a technical term for those? You've been wearing glasses your whole life. You should know this. Well, okay, you've had a face your whole life. What do you call those two <laughs> little things right under your nose and above your lip? <laughs> yeah, see? <laughs> I have no so, idea. Nevertheless, well, see there? Do you know? Of course I do. Shady Rays isn't happy <laughs> unless you're happy, folks. And I'm telling you, that's why they've got the industry-leading lost and broken replacement program. If you break or lose your pair, even the second you take them out of the box. Now, obviously, that would have to be willful. If you break or lose them, the second you take them out of the box, you're doing it on purpose. You're being a prick. Go ahead and admit it. But they will send you a replacement pair, no questions asked. Now, also, here's the thing. If you don't like them, you can exchange them or return them for free. And to be honest, they've got a special deal going right now where if you buy one pair of Shady Rays, you get a second pair for free. And they come covered under this guarantee also. I'm thinking that some enterprising son of a bitch out there is going to figure out a way to work this into getting 700 free pairs no. of Shady Rays. But every, it'll be worth it because everybody else will have high-quality sunglasses that will protect their eyes from the, from the burning, the searing pain. Do you know what it's like, Brian, when you look up at the sun and that, that molten lava on the hottest surface in the universe 
bears down on your corneas and your eyeballs, no. your pupils start smoking? No, I don't stare at the sun. Why would anyone well, do that? Well, boy, you ought to try it sometime. What a what? rush. And what? I'm telling you, <laughs> that your pupils start smoking. What a and rush. And all of a sudden, flames leap up from your, from your eyelashes, and it's uncomfortable. But if you got shady rays on, you can stare right at that thing no. for hours on end. No. Go ahead, try it. No damage whatsoever. Let's just jump in right now, ladies and gentlemen, say... That is something you shouldn't do, whether wearing shady rays or not. Never stare at the surface of the sun. Never look at the sun directly. Even don't if you're wearing make, shady rays, contact. which are such fine glasses, but even the finest of sunglasses, don't look at the sun, ladies and gentlemen. Don't make eye contact, is what you're saying with the sun. That's right. Bitch. All right. Keep your eyes down. <laughs> and I'll tell you what. The, the <laughs> What are you going to tell me? You'll tell me what? Let me hear you. Well, you hear it right here, folks. I'll Obviously, Jim's been staring at the sun, and he's melting right now inside of his head. I'll tell you something here in a minute. <laughs> Shady Rays. <laughs> Bitch. <laughs> Shady Rays. Let's get back to them, though. They're fantastic. Not shady at all. Jim so, Shady Rays. <laughs> The impact, the, the program that they have here on this program is the Shady Rays Impact Program is what I'm saying. Works with nonprofits. Oh, my God, I'm dizzy. Worldwide to make an impact on the lives of children and young adults. If you'd like to make an impact on the life of a children or young adult, you've got to buy Shady Ray sunglasses. They build play sets for pediatric cancer patients. They create adventures for young adults with cancer in Mississippi. Or that's cancer and MS. What? I'm sorry. Cancer and MS, not cancer in Mississippi. <laughs> <laughs> See, this is not funny. Cancer and MS are not funny. No. And neither is Mississippi. Well, no, Mississippi is fucking bone serious. I've been there. They'll cut you. But anyway, folks, right now, what's better than getting one pair of Shady Rays and not worrying if you break or lose them? Getting two pairs and not worrying. It just be frivolous with them. Because it doesn't matter. They'll be replaced until the end of time. Take Go care of your glasses. Shady. Take care of your sunglasses. No, just fucking kick them, stomp them, slap them no. around. No. Fucking drag them down the street behind a bumper. We don't encourage that. Well, we can't stop it. Go to ShadyRays.com. <laughs> slash J. Woo. Go to Shady Rays. I'll spell that for you people. S H A D Y R A Y S, shadyrays.com, D O T C O M, slash S L A S H, J C E, shadyrays.com, slash J C E. Use the code J C E for a limited time, possibly until they hear this spot. When you buy one pair of Shady Rays, you're going to get a second pair for free. So spend very little money on one, get another pair for free, and that's four times as good as buying two of the expensive ones. So you got a 33% chance of coming out ahead. Shady Rays.